Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Welcome to the International Septic Association. My name is Greg Savelle, coming to you from Denver, Colorado, and I'm with my colleague, uh, Matei Mignac, who is coming from Ljubljana, in the beautiful country of Slovenia. Matei, good morning. Good morning, Greg, or good evening, rather. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Right, right. So today we're going to talk about accreditation and certification of septed. Those uh, are topics we've we are a part of um, in the International Septic Association. I'm the uh, co coordinator of the certificate, the course accreditation program, and Matea is the coordinator of the uh, the individual uh, individual program for certification, the ICA uh, SEPTED certification program, ICCP. And we've gotten a lot of questions over the last number of years about how you certify and how do you accredit. So today, that's what we're going to deep dive into those topics. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Greg. Um, okay, so let's start with some background information about um, what we're actually um, talking about today, so certification and accreditation. So let's start um, maybe just with a question, why do we actually need SAP certification and accreditation, and what does it actually mean to be professionally certified in SAPTET? Right. So, so, well, I mean, the and you and I were talking about this not long ago about why do you do this? Why do you bother with this? And the reason you certify in crime prevention through environmental design is the reason you certify in any topic, whether it's it's uh, planning or um, uh, architecture or law or what have you. And the reason for certification, you know, usually it comes down to four points. Uh, one is if you're a professional, professionals look for professional development. They look to improve their skills as a professional. They're in the field. They want to learn more. More, uh, more knowledge, uh, more things to apply, and certification allows them to do that. Often, professional organizations require you to upgrade your skills every year. So, professional development is number one. Uh, number two is professional association is, is certification means to be professionally uh, certified by a professional association of your peers, uh, and that association says that they consider you're qualified in the following areas or competencies. What we're calling it in our program. So the association is a professional group. In this case, it's international. It's around the world. And it's it's attesting to the fact that you do that. That's what that quote stands for right there. A third-party attestation of an individual knowledge of a certain, a certain industry or profession. And that's us. And we're the professional society that does that. Um, another reason to uh, uh, certify is because often you, if you're employed by an organization, clients, uh, people who you serve, uh, their clients will often look for competencies, look for people to come to their store or come to their business or come to their residence or wherever they happen to be. Uh, and they, uh, they look for people who are certified and they want to know what that means. This provides an answer to that question. Uh, some people who are just getting started in professions, students, for example, want to enhance their resumes. Certification allows them to do that. And, uh, and then if you're a course instructor, a developer a pro of a program, you'd like to make sure your course fits into the profession itself. So accreditation does that. And finally, the last reason for certification is the governments and clients and uh, organizations are looking for qualified experts. They're asking when they build new developments, they're asking for people who are certified, but they don't actually know, I mean, governments don't know what SEPTED is or what's, what certification looks like. So the International SEPTED Association has provided an answer to that question and it's been around, the certification has been around for about 15 or 16 years and accreditation for about three or four. So that's the reason why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe just to add to that, uh, within the ICA, we have been talking a lot about professionalizing the field as well of SAPTA because a lot of other professions and um, basically professionals have some type of certification, some type of professional vetting, you know, to be able to practice the field where, and in that currently, we don't have a mandatory type of vetting per se, but um, we're 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 trying to get ensure that those who do practice that in the field do have a certain level of that expected competency, and that's also why we're supporting or promoting this type of certification for that. Right. Yeah. Right. And, as, and the ICA is the first organization and currently the only organization that, that provides this level of certification 
Uh, and we'll get into some of the details of that later on. But we wanted to do a bit of a deep dive, get into the technical parts of certification and the te technical parts of accreditation, which are different. And uh, so we have, um, I think it's 11 questions we're going to go through. And that was number mm -hmm. question number one, which is why do it. And then now we're going to launch into the rest of the questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, let me explain a little bit about uh, what the ICCP or um, or in, with full name ICA SEPTA certification program for individuals actually is. So um, this program was launched now 16 years ago. It's hard to believe it's been out mm -hmm. for this long already. Um, in, in overall uh, coordinator of the, the, of the program was Josh Brown, who was also one of the co-developers together with you as well, Greg. Um, and this is essentially a competency-based certification. So it is intended, uh, like we said earlier, to vet those who practice SEP that, um, so to be able to uh, recognize them as professions in the field, to recognize their professional capacity, to be able to practice and apply the knowledge that they have. And this is something that's actually very important here. It's not just about the knowledge that you have, but also about your skills and experience. And this is something that Josh Brown was also uh, very adamant about. It's about demonstrated uh, competencies, not just having the knowledge of it. And this is why it's so important when we uh, we ask our applicants to submit their record book in which they document their experience, uh, they also need to submit some evidence of acquiring that experience for particular competencies because we want to see that they haven't just maybe taken a separate course, but that they've been able to actually apply that knowledge in uh, on the ground in practice. So this is what we're um, looking for, basically applied knowledge. And the, um, and the <laughs> if I could just jump in there, Matteo, I want to just make a, a, a kudos to uh, Josh Brown, one of the first directors of the International Septic Association. Josh is from Virginia. Josh was one of the leaders in this, and he carried the the flag for accreditation for for well over a decade, and and was one of the pioneers who really carried this thing forward. And and uh, and when we started, uh, we got a group of people from all over the field, because there was nothing, there was no way to certify, you know, septet. I mean, people took a, a course of two or three day course, and they would show up at a scene and and they would make recommendations, and it, it really wasn't working that well because. And what ended up happening was some of these some of these recommendations were implemented, but they still had crime, and there were civil suits and there were legal suits, and the courts would say, "What's certification mean?" And currently, there are some set that practitioners, many who are in the ICA, such as myself, who 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 you know, go to court for legal cases to attest to what is and what is not certification. So this the first group when we started this, we had a group of of about twenty people, um, and uh, included people like Josh Brown. Uh, former president of the Virginia Crime Fiction Association, Macarena Rao, the architect from Chile, currently the president of the ICA. Uh, people like Tim Crow, who um, who, who uh, was the first director of the U.S. Crime Fiction Institute in in Kentucky. Uh, he was part of our discussions. Randy Atlas, of course, is an architect from Miami, a criminologist. Myself, uh, Barry Davidson, the former co-founder, one of the co-founders of the ICA. Uh, Tim Pasco, uh, director of the U.K. Design and Crime Association. Uh, who is one of the early members of the ICA. Uh, Paul Van Sumeren from the Netherlands. He's also the director of the European Crime Design and Crime Association. So we had a whole group of people from all over the world who've been doing professionals doing this for many, many years. And all together, we went through a period of about two years of, of, of serving each other, doing some planning discussions, uh, uh, canvassing the field, and coming up with what, what comprises certification. What are the competencies that comprise it? And, and that's how the whole thing got started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we will show you briefly what some of those competencies are. Um, and before I go there, I do want to um, uh, want to clarify that we also have two levels of uh, individual personal certification, and these are practitioner level and professional level. And these have been recently kind of reframed in terms of their um, labels. So uh, practitioner used to be the basic level, and professional used to be advanced level. So now the new um, the new categorizations are practitioner professional levels. And I would like to show you briefly on, um, on our website where uh, what the, the main difference actually is between the two levels. So if we look at, so this is on our website, uh, septa.net, ICCP. 
So this is where uh, we can see the nine, uh, uh, excuse me, 11 competency units that are part of this program. So these are basically what we're looking for in our applicants. These are the this is what they need to demonstrate that they have experience and skills in um, and we can see that we have two columns here so the practitioner level uh, competencies uh, we have eight of them so any applicants who is applying for practitioner level uh, certification needs to demonstrate all eight of these competencies so the these competencies are the shaded areas here uh, uh, within this matrix and for professional level, in the right column, we can see that all 11 uh, competency units are shaded. So our applicants need to demonstrate competency in all 11 of these uh, competency units. Um, okay, so Greg, shall we look at uh, what the competency actually is? Yeah. Yeah, and that's the question. That one of the questions we get asked a lot is, "What is a competency? What what comprises a competency?" And you know, a competency is kind of halfway between practitioner, professional practice, and educational uh, uh, curriculum. It's it's education on one side, and it's, it's practitioner based on the other. And in the field of education, there's something known as KSAs or or knowledge, skills, and abilities. And and, and the competency basically is a combination of that. It's a combination of knowledge, your knowledge, your skills, and your abilities. And so we break it down into two sort of categories, what you can do and how you can demonstrate that and what you know. And of course, it's difficult to know what you know unless you can demonstrate it. So they have to go together. So what you'll see when you open up the PDF on the website, when you look and start to reading into the details of the, of the competencies, is you'll look at something like this. Mateus just put it on the screen here. And here is the breakdown of what a competency is. Now, this is the first of the 11 competencies, and it's called defining the scope and the task. And generally speaking, what this, what, what, the, how the KSAs br break down into the competency itself is the, the application, the, 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 act, the way you, what you do is listed in the top of the competency. So where it says competent practitioner, the competent practitioner is expected to. And those numbers there are the things you're expected to show us that you can identify a task and a project that you can establish uh, terms of reference, um, that you can gather uh, uh, the practitioner background information, or sorry, preliminary background information on what the problem happens to be that you're going to accept it on. Uh, and this just preliminary information, not the full research, just that here's what it looks like. Here's the, here's the scope of the problem. And then finally, that you uh, you know how to develop strategies for approaching the task or project. So in other words, if you're a project consultant, and you're working for a client. The first thing they're going to look in your proposal is they're going to look for what the scope of what you're going to do is. They're going to they're going to hire you or bring you in to do something. They're going to want to know exactly what are the things you're going to be doing. So you have to provide for them in the in in a proposal a scoping document, a scoping section that says, "Here's what I'm going to do," and and here are the tasks that I'm going to lay out. And even if you're not coming into a, a, the SEPTED world as a consultant, say you're coming in as a, as a researcher and you're going to write a research paper, even there, the researcher is required to submit a proposal or a paper in which the paper outlines the scope of the research. And that's called the method section. You, know, you have your methodology and how you're going to do the research and what your literature review is. So you have to demonstrate this scoping concept that you can, you can lay out what the, scope, what, what, what the scope is, how big it is, how SEPTED applies to that. And what you can and can't do as a septet person, because that's what the ethics come into, right? And also your terms of reference, what, what, how much, how much you're going to be spending time on, and so forth. So that's essentially what what a competency is in terms of the, the uh, the abilities and and the background knowledge. If you just slide down the PDF there on the first competency, Matea, mm -hmm. you'll see the section in each of the each of the competencies called the relevant core subjects. And the core subjects is the knowledge part of the KSAs. It's the it's the it's the background stuff you need to know in order to demonstrate that first competency. And so, for example, in the scoping aspect, you need to have some basic crime prevention and septic principles, you know, knowledge on that. So you'd get that in a book or in a course you could study or a university program. Another core subject would be applied research skills. Now, so you need to know something about research in order to know what you need to, how you can scope what your activities, you need to know what those activities would be. And so maybe they'd be surveys, maybe they would be looking at crime statistics or whatever it happens to be. So you need obviously some background knowledge in what applied research skills look like. Uh, and then a co another core subject would be experience implementing accepted. 
and so forth. And I won't go through all of them, but each one of the companies just have both these, uh, the things you're expected to do and show us in your evidence and the background knowledge that backs that up. So I hope that helps describe what a competency is. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, thank you, Greg. So again, you have the same type of um, kind of explanation or description of each competency for uh, for all 11 of them. So every applicant should basically go through these to ensure that they actually address um, the relevant subjects when they, um, and not the subjects, but the core subjects as well. So knowledge and um, skills when they actually apply for competency, right? It needs to be clearly demonstrated in the record book that they are submitting to us. Right. Okay. So, um, okay. We hope that this explains briefly what um, the difference is. And you can see that we have um, 11 competencies overall. Um, we won't go into depth on each, on all of them now, but we do ask you to contact us if you have questions about any particulars. But do please first uh, go through the document. And you have a description, um, basically the document that we just showed you, showed you, you can download it here um, as well. Okay, is there anything else you would like to add to that, Greg? Well, just the question, mm -hmm. the applicant may say, why, why would I be, uh, why would I apply for a practitioner level in ICCP or why right. would I apply for professional level in ICCP? And the answer is, it really depends where you're, co where you're coming from at what level you're coming in at. Because some people will come into the program as novices or they've just done a course in Sept 10 and they, they think it's really cool and they want to enter the program and they don't know what mm -hmm. to do. So they would come in as, as a practi basic practitioner level and they may not have all these competencies finished by the time they apply. And that's okay. We don't require you to be at a, at a final stage here. The, we see the, the certification process as a process, as, a, as an educational experience. And, and if you don't have all these eight competencies, completed, maybe you have five of them or six of them. And, and what will happen is you'll be assigned a mentor. Each, each applicant has a board of reviewers and each on the board of reviewers is a lead reviewer. And that lead reviewer may act as your mentor or may assign somebody as your mentor. And your mentor will basically say, you know what, in order to finish off your, comp your, your third and fourth competency, here are some things you might want to look at. Maybe you could take a course or maybe you could read this book. Or maybe you could get a project on this or, or something like that. And they'll kind of guide you over the next, you know, uh, weeks or months um, to, to get to the level where you really can go from, you know, the the uh, the application stage to finishing your record book into the final examination stage. Does that make sense, Matthew? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. Yeah, that's something actually that, uh, thank you for reminding me that I did want to mention because, for example, a practitioner um, might be in, let's say, first year of practicing, or maybe they're just getting into the field, whereas a professional might actually be practicing for three, five or years or longer. And that's where they were actually able to get these more advanced uh, level skills, right, um, that we're actually uh, requesting. So those three additional competence units that the professional level applicants need to satisf satisfy. Yeah, yeah, because it is a practitioner certification. It's a certification that the ICA says, we believe you're certified as a person who can practice the act of SEPTED. There are lots of people who do SEPTED right now who aren't certified or lots of people who have been writing about SEPTED or publishing books on SEPTED who haven't been, been doing it in, in the field. And that's fine. That's a whole other area of expertise. And they would get other forms of certification for that. But with the ICA, we're a practitioner organization. We're interested in certifying people who are actually going to be doing SEPTED. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Great. Let's um, move on to the next uh, question. So uh, we looked at ICCP now. Can we maybe just explain now what the course accreditation program is, which is kind of linked to uh, our individual course, um, individual personal certification program? Sure, right. So how right. are they linked? Right, right. Yeah. So, th I mean, when the personal certification was around for a long time, many questions would come up over the years about, well, is there some course I can take? Or if I take a course, do I automatically get certified? And questions like that. And the answer was no, because they weren't linked programs. We didn't have another program to link to it. So what happened was about three or four years ago, and again, a, a group of people got together, and that was under my direction. And a bunch of us sat down and uh, and uh, the same, a lot of the same people who were in the original program were part of that research team, and as well as other people as well. And we sat down over a period of about a year and we went through a whole series of questions about 
you know, what does a course look like when it's approved, when it's a, set, a septed a, approved course? What might it look like? What are the, what are the, what's the curriculum required in there? So we had to tap, in, tap into educational knowledge, educational theory about what a curriculum is and how you approve a curriculum and how you evaluate a student in class and so forth. And so, so we, we tried to leave it as open as possible because there's many instructors with many courses out there and they evaluate them in different ways. Some, some um, do project work and they have the students demonstrate their projects in class as a way to demonstrate and evaluate their proficiency. And other instructors still use multiple choice tests from the old days and they use those. And we didn't want to get into exactly how you evaluate, but we just wanted to see that the curriculum had necessary materials and it had some way for you to evaluate that. So we ended up creating this course accreditation program, the CAP program. And the, and, and the CAP program basically has two levels. And what we basically said was, was in CAP level class A, it would be a, a full course accredited. That is, eight of the 11 competencies would be covered in this class. And when a student took the class, those eight would be done. So when they applied to the ICCP, those eight would be taken care of. And they would simply tell the ICCP review board, I've already got that. Here's my certificate that I have been, I've been successfully completed a class A course. Therefore, I don't have to bother with my record book or getting into any examination about those eight competencies. I just have to finish up the last few. And so that's a full, full class A. And the, and the question was, how do they finish up the last few? They do a couple of projects in SEPTED. After the class, after the course, they go and do work in SEPTED. They bring those course, those those project reports, or as much as they can, because sometimes they're confidential and you, you have to redact some sections, and that's fine. We understand that. So they bring those project reports and say, here are project reports that demonstrate the remaining uh, competencies beyond the eight that I did in my class A course. So that's what a class A class does. A class B course that's accredited is a bit different. This is when an instructor doesn't, you know, maybe they're doing an online class and they can't do field work. So some of the competencies pertain to being in the field and working with the team and so forth. You can't always do that when you do an online class, but you still should get the ability to have some kind of credit. So we created the class B certification, or sorry, the class B accreditation. And class B, basically the instructor comes or the course developer comes, sends to us the materials and say, we'd like to get accredited at a class B level. And I think our material in our curriculum covers you know, competency number three and competency number two. And and so we'd say, well, let's have a look at it. We send it to our review board. Review, review board looks at that and they say, well, you know what? It's really good. You may need, need to add this, maybe need to add that. And that person adds those things. And then we say, now you're there. So your course is now uh, accredited at a class B level for these competencies, whether it's one, whether it's two, whether it's three. And I think, Matei, we go up to seven, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for class B, um, any course instructor or course developer can have up to seven competencies accredited. So those competencies are the same of seven out of those 11 that we showed you mm -hmm. earlier um, in the list of competencies that are within the ICCP program. Right. Yeah. And, and obviously it wouldn't make exactly. any sense to, to do more than seven because if you do eight, then you're actually at a class A level. So why yeah. would you just do the class A? So we, left, we, we limited it to seven. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but one of the important points, uh, like you said, is that for class A um, course, it needs to be in person. At least some of the components need to be face to face. They, it yeah. can't all be online, right? That's one of the um, one of the main differences as well. Right. You need to do, I mean, if you're going to demonstrate working in a multidisciplinary team, or if you're going to do mm -hmm. an actual project to write a project report, uh, which is one of the competencies, or to write an evaluation uh, implementation report. And of course, writing a, a, a writing a, a report with recommendations is not the same as writing a report with recommendations with the implementation plan. They're two different competencies, and mm -hmm. um, and you really can't do some of that stuff unless you're working in a classroom environment and working in the field and doing a, a class project and actually getting hands-on practice. So class B doesn't isn't able to cover that, that like a class A does, but you can still get a lot of skills from a class B course. You know, you can learn how to how to learn how to read plans, for example. One of the mm -hmm. one of the one of the competencies in in um, in the ICCP is plan reading. And you'll notice when you go through the matrix, plan reading actually is two different competencies. Plan reading is 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 uh, if I think it's competency number four, is it Matea? 
four is the yeah the original the basic one the and basic then one. the advanced is five yeah and the advanced is five right and the, and the difference between four and five is the difference between class a and class b is you can do you know class uh competency four which is just how you read a plan how to how to decipher it how to interpret it you can do that in a class B class. You can do that online, for example. But you really can't get to the point where you work with a team and actually develop a plan with an architect and a design, unless you're working on an actual project in the field. And so the class, you know, the competency five, which is plan reading advanced, that would fit into a class A course, not a class B. Does that explain it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. And that actually speaks to the importance of what we said at start, how this is a a uh, competency-based program where we're looking for experienced and demonstrated competency rather than, right. you know, just rather than knowledge per se, because we right. must have, we might have a lot of knowledge, but if we're not able to apply it and practice it, then um, we might not be, you know, able to actually independently practice in the yeah. field, right? So, yeah. yeah. And this is a practitioner uh, certification. So you can demonstrate and do, and you're accomplished at doing it is what we're, what we are attesting to as this ICA is when you have this certification behind these letters behind your name, ICCP, uh, they, they're telling the world that you can do this, not just that you know it, but you know how to practice it. So shall we move mm -hmm. on to the next? So this, I think that covers the basics of the ICCP uh, and the CAP program. Did we miss anything? Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that I think that's about it. But if our viewers have any questions, of course, um, contact us and we'll provide that information um, how to get to us at the end as well. Okay. But so I suggest. To, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, I suggest we go to our part two, yeah, talking about professional yeah. septic practice a little bit. Right. So, question four mm -hmm. is Is every septic certification le legitimate? If I take a septic course, uh, <laughs> Doesn't mean that I'm certified. Okay, so, so um, which we have kind of touched on <laughs> just now a little bit, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. If I take a class, am I certified? You know, just any class? Uh, no, you're not. I mean, well, y y you have a, a certificate of completion in any course you take on SEPTA. Anybody who's knowledge not knowledgeable experience in SEPTA can take a class and can run a class and can give it certificate, and that's fine. That's been the way for. Well, I think since SEPTED began in 1971 with Clarence Ray Jeffrey's first book on the topic and 1972 with Oscar Newman's book called Defensible Space, uh, of course, building on the work of Jane Jacobs from 61, uh, that's kind of the beginning of the SEPTED term and movement. And since then, uh, since 1975, I think was the first class at the uh, University of Kentucky's Institute. I think that's gone now, but um, but that was kind of the first course and then I think the second was in Vancouver, Canada, with um, the work of Mount of Police ran a class since 82. And those are the first courses, per se, and then it spread around the world. So, and those are still around, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with those courses. But they are not; they don't fit into the ICC program, per se. So just taking that doesn't make you certified. In order to be certified, you actually have to go through some kind of a process. And that's what this is. Um, and 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 it's important to, to distinguish this because there is there is legitimate certification. I don't know if I'm covering other top questions we're going to cover later on or not, Matea. But but I think it's important to acknowledge that there's what what we mean by legitimate certification is we mean with certification there are two levels required in order for it to be legitimate and professional, and that's what most other courses can't 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 prove. Uh, it, it, number one is it needs to be objective and third party. So if you're in a if you're in a course that's run by a consulting firm, for example, the consulting firm has a service they're providing for you. You're paying for it, and that's fine. But them saying they certify that only says that they're certifying it for their course and the way they interpret SEPTED. There's nothing broad about that. There's nothing international about that, and it's certainly not third party objective. They have a vested interest in saying that you're certified because they just you just paid them to say that. So third party is what the International Septet Association is. It's in it's it is basically a nonprofit organization that's not affiliated. It doesn't have skin in that game, as as they say in, in American football. So what that means essentially is it's a third party professional organization and it's not a private for-profit consulting firm. And and the not for profit independent professional status is is the first category, the first hurdle you must jump over in order to be legitimately certified. The second hurdle is professional status. 
And that means you have an organization that's certifying you that represents the septic industry. So it's not just a small group of police, uh, retired police officers running a consulting firm or a small group of, of urban planners doing this. It, it, it's not just planning. It's not just architecture. SEPTED is all those things. And so when you look at a group that's nonprofit and that's professional and that represents the septic industry, like the ICA, it has planners and students and researchers and professors and architects and police officers, security people and students and so forth. It has a whole broad array of people that gives it that, that holistic perspective. And that's what professional status in our field actually means. And that, that group follows a methodology. And the, the, the methodology says in order to really do SEPTED properly with the right recommendations, you need to follow these steps. And these are the steps we found through our research and through the scientific studies on this field that make the most amount of sense. So that's what the professional SEPTED industry says. So those are the two hurdles that, that distinguish SEPTED certification in the ICA with just getting a core certificate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Yeah, you have kind of addressed two uh, questions at once, which is excellent. Um, so just to maybe summarize that um, it needs to be the course need or certification program needs to be third party it needs to be independent so by a non-profit organization such as the ICA um, ideally and there needs to be a professionally approved level of proficiency by multidisciplinary team because it's a except that is a multidisciplinary approach right so we need to um, ensure that there's um, that the, the multidisciplinary practice and nature of the problems is um, incorporated in the in the program. Yeah. Um, so something that's also different with our program is that it's not course based, which we were also uh, talking about. And we we actually really welcome um, our applicants to to take some kind of uh, training course before they actually apply for certification. I mean, it's not mandatory, right? This is something that um, we're uh, often talking about, and I am actually jumping to the next question, so I'll just um, put it on there. But uh, something that uh, people often ask um, ask us is, do I actually need to take a course to be able to apply for certification with the ICA? And no, it is not mandatory, but we would expect that the person who applies has had some kind of either personal um, a training or they might have taken a course, they might have taken a university type of course, um, they might have been self-taught and so on, or they might have experience. And yesterday, Greg, maybe if you can um, uh, tell the story of Oscar Newman, for example, who you know didn't have any professional training except that per se, but he was one of the pioneers in the field. Right, right. right. So, so, and so what we did was we were very careful in the early development stages of this program to make it competency-based. And that is to say that just because you, you have a university degree, for example, or a graduate degree or a certification from a, a college in a particular technical field, doesn't you don't get certified by that. that. That's simply knowledge you get. You have to demonstrate those through competency. So some, like an employer or, or a company or a university saying that th this person is definitely qualified, that wouldn't mean anything because they haven't demonstrated anything with any evidence to show that. The ICA has to be confident that when it gives this ICCP status or CAP status to a certificate or to a course or to a manual uh, that you put behind your name, that there's something behind that that has shown, you've shown us that that's the case. So, so be careful when you take these SEPTEC courses, when they say you, you're being certified, ensure they, they're taught by qualified instructors from many fields who have this certification already. Uh, because you can, you know, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware, you know, be very careful about this. What the case with Oscar Newman is interesting because if you think Oscar Newman was the, one of the fellows who really defined and, and created the field we're working in now, at least the early phases of, of SEPTED, what we call first generation SEPTED back in the 70s. And Oscar Newman didn't take a class in SEPTED. He didn't, he didn't was not certified in any of this stuff because he actually helped create the field. So it would be silly to say to Oscar Newman, you know, you have to be certified to do this. But that's actually that's actually the whole reason we created this certification program was because there's not a lot of Oscar Newmans left out there. And, you know, and 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 Oscar Newman demonstrated many, many times through his field work, his uh, publications, his videos, and the fact that he actually did this to learn how to do this, to write and document it. So, you know, he didn't, he wasn't certified, but, and so do I need to be certified? No, no, you don't always need to be certified. Only if you, if you want to cover these four things I talked about earlier on, you want to, you know, prove to a client that you have these skills of joining a professional organization. But if, but there are people who do accept that anyway. Um, and that's fine. 
but they're not certified. And, and, there's, and the, there is a difference between what we're talking about and somebody who's just practicing by themselves. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can actually link this to the next question as well, which is, does my government actually require SEPTA certification? Because we have noticed over the past couple of years that more and more local governments and organizations that are yeah. issuing requests for proposals are actually expecting their applicants or accepted experts that are going to be part of the project uh, that they actually have ICCP certification with right. the ICA. So th they are actually looking for someone who has been vetted in a way so, so that they know whom they are hiring, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah, but what about the government? I mean, is it currently required? To, do you have, so have you heard of to... anyone? Right, yeah, so this has come up a number of times. My government has a, a certification qualification requirement that anybody who's a consultant or anybody who does the work has to be certified. Uh, you know, no, that's actually not the case. What your government has, they have it made, they might have a certification for consultants in general to have certain ethical requirements and ethical standards and so forth. That may be the case, but very few governments even know what SEPTED is. And if they do, it's usually at the, at the state, provincial, or municipal level where they've created some guidelines, some SEPTED guidelines, such as the uh, international standards or uh, uh, organization guidelines that the ICA helped participate in developing uh, just recently. Or perhaps um, your, your city has some bylaws or ordinances about SEPTED and so forth. Uh, they may require that. Um, but that's not to do with your certification. That's simply that they're saying that there's general guidelines we'd like you to follow. So, but, so some governments may have some specific requirements that you must obtain some more general government approved certification, but that's not SEPTED. There's, that has nothing to do with the professional certification and SEPTED offered by an international non-governmental group such as the ICA. Obtaining the ICA certification does not disqualify you from obtaining those government certifications, but it's probably going to be the opposite. When the government sees you have international, you know, a, a stamp of approval, they're they're going to going to they're going to go. Oh, this person actually has some external non you know uh, uh, independent uh, verification that what they're talking about actually means something. So no, the government don't, governments typically don't require it. But more and more municipal governments are requiring some certification practice expertise in SEPTED. But uh, mm -hmm. governments don't typically have this kind, of, this kind of requirement. They're nowhere near that, that stage right now. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, OK. Uh, I also want to touch upon, before we go to the process stuff, um, and touch upon the ethics of SEPTED practice, because we have found that one of the crucial um, kind of aspects that we do need to consider as well and we we have you know the ICA has um, ratified the the code of ethics last year as well so we we it's mandatory for all our certified practitioners as well as members to actually agree and accept that um, uh, code of ethics and abide by it um, then we also held a webinar on the topic because there's you know said that has been on the hot seat over the past year um, so could you maybe talk about ethical implications a little bit of maybe poor septed practice and why it's so important to have a professional type of standard when we talk about septed. Yeah, well, we both can because you were heavily involved in the ethical uh, research as well. And you, you're, you're a bit of a uh, authority on this whole topic of ethical practice in septed and you're doing your doctorate in septed right now. So this is, a, this is what it's all about. And you're, and you're right. I mean, your points are correct that, that SEPTED has been under the hot seat lately as a result of, of what's called exclusionary practices. That is SEPTED practitioners who aren't properly trained, in my view, who aren't certified and have gone to these places and not done proper research, have recommended you know, the, 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 the fencing of certain areas or the exclusion of certain groups, often racial groups, you know. Uh, folks who are of one ethnic uh, persuasion, maybe uh, African American folks, and uh, are, are left out one, or homeless folks is another area where there's a lot of these exclusionary practices, and this is seen as 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 uh, as prejudicial, and it's seen as racist and so forth. And these claims have have weight if 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 you don't have an ethical standard code to practice or to follow, and that's what the ICA has. It has it has very specific things that we expect anybody in the ICA who's a member to follow, especially those who are certified, and especially those who are teaching a CAP course, must follow these principles and must be in line with these principles. And uh, failing to do so, can, you can be removed from the program and, and uh, removed from the organization because we believe in ethical practice is critically important. And one of the, one of the, uh, one of the 
the main ethical principles we have in our code is do no harm or do as little harm as, as, as absolutely possible so that when you're doing SEPTAD, you make sure that everybody's involved and it's a collaborative discussion. Um, and you, you have lots to say about this too, Matea. You've been thinking about this for a long mm -hmm. time. Yeah, well, something that I mean, something that we also uh, include in the webinar was how important it is to actually be inclusive from the beginning, from initial planning stages to then actual application on the ground. And it might not be possible in every single project, especially more security oriented projects. But except that, in our view, is an inclusive, um, inclusive process. Also, it's not just a product; it's also a process. So it needs to include the relevant, uh, not just stakeholders, but also relevant actors at the table. Um, right. So we need to be as inclusive as possible in order to address some of the challenges that, you know, it's better to challenge, um, address those challenges earlier rather than deal with them at the end where you don't have the buy-in, where you have conflicts with different groups and you have actually disadvantaged some groups as opposed to, you know, um, try to do the least harm possible, um, yeah. as you mentioned. And yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, please, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, something that I actually want to mention also was that this is why our certification program focuses on the process as well. It puts so much emphasis on being able to identify, you know, the what what type of issue you're dealing with, with so with the scoping and then being able to collect the necessary information and um and basically conduct uh, perform that due diligence within the process so you're not just jumping to conclusions and jump into solutions before you actually understand what a problem is and what kind of implications including ethical implications you yeah. might have so this yeah. is why that process mm -hmm. is so important this is why we put so much emphasis on uh, those competencies within the process yeah, and why why this is a competency based process, not a you know a, a qualification based or certificate based mm -hmm. or you know university degree based or or what have you. This is competency based. You demonstrate activities. You demonstrate them through certain reports and certain proofs and evidence and so forth. And uh, and yeah, and and the, of all the of all the components of the certification program in the ICA, this is the this is the one red zone. This is the one that you can't sort of cross. You know, ethics are the key to making SEPTED work effectively. And, uh, and you know, if there's a letter or a complaint that comes through um, practice ab about ethics and that, you know, the board deals with it, the, the review, the, the certification boards review it, it may go to the executive board, the ICA. This is a big deal. So we're very adamant about the ethics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And since we're talking so much about our code of ethics, you can actually find it on our website as well. Um, and if you're a member, you should um, you should have seen it when you sign up as well. So, okay. Um, thank you so much, Greg. Um, yeah, next I question. think that was an important discussion. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's go to kind of the final part, um, and we're just uh, gonna touch on this. We're not gonna go into too much detail, but the process of how and who can actually apply and how to go about it. So, um, so if I kind of start with who can apply for the ICCP. So it's fairly simple. Basically, anyone can apply, uh, given that they are able to demonstrate um, the competencies in the way that we discuss. So they're, they're going, they're, they need to be able to uh, also provide some evidence. Um, you know, describe uh, what uh, describe for each competency how they have acquired it, and then also being able to provide supporting evidence for for those individual competencies. And like Greg said, it's also a mentorship-based program. So um, if someone is missing some parts of um, the competency requirements, we'll be able to guide our applicants through that as well. Um, but um, we, we would probably say that some kind of experience, some kind of project work is necessary before someone applies because um, completely coming from the beginning, not having any experience it's quite difficult to for us to be able to then assess whether someone is competent uh, competent on those eleven uh, points that we uh, basically assess people on. Um, then each applicant also needs to be a member of the ICA and they need to adhere to the ICA code of ethics. So, yeah. Okay, Greg. What about the CAP program? Who can apply for a course accreditation program? 
Right. So a lot of the same points you just made regarding the code of ethics and, and being a member uh, also apply to this question, who can apply for CAP? And the answer is uh, anyone can apply for CAP. Uh, anybody who's got a SEPTEC course or they want a course approved and so forth. But the but the stipulation is a, you have to be a member of the ICA simply because in order to be held accountable to the code of ethics, that's that's what you are when you're a member. So uh, joining the ICA is, is, is the first step. Uh, and then the second is uh, you can apply and get your course reviewed and get the curriculum looked at and reviewed and so forth. Um, but to teach the class, you need to be an ICCP uh, certified member. Uh, and be, the reason is because if you're doing a class that's, that's CAP uh, accredited, either at A or B level, what you're basically saying to the world is you're saying, we're going to help students get into the ICC program. In order to do that, you actually have to be in the ICC program. You have to have finished it. So you do need to uh, have at least a, if you have a multiple team in teaching, for example, maybe two or three instructors, your lead instructor who's coordinating the course needs to be ICCP certified so that you have somebody there who, is, who knows the program. Did I miss anything, Mateo? Mm -hmm. No, I yeah, I completely agree because um, that person will also, in a way, be a mentor, right? Like like right. we're offering mentorship to to applicants. A person, a, a cap instructor, will will essentially be a mentor to their students right. who will then apply for ICCP. So it, it's important that they have gone through the process themselves as well. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, we're, we're nearly there. So let's just quickly uh, look at the ICCP and CAP process and how to actually go um, about applying for them. So I would like to um, share screen to show that. So let me just do this. Okay, so... Okay, so if we look at i i want to show this just briefly so that you know the um, the chart that i'm talking about but please have a look at the complete chart on our website as well um because um i'm not gonna um i'm not gonna bore you reading through this um but i will go through each of the steps uh for you so if we so initially when you need to select your certification level so we we're talking about practitioner level and then professional levels. So for the ICCP two levels, practitioner and professional, you need to you you can obviously contact us and consult with us whether um, you you're ready for the, the practitioner level or professional at that stage. But um, you can definitely um, we can definitely help you decide on which one to go with. So that's the first step. Then the second step, this is where you then submit the application, and that application or application pack rather will include um, some information about yourself. Then you will also need to submit the fee, uh, which is currently for uh, first time applicants is 275 Canadian dollars, I believe. Although we do and review the fees research... every other year, right? Yeah, every, every th we review them, yeah, um, to, yeah, to make sure that, um, you know, we, we keep up with the expenses as well. So yeah, 285 currently, um, and then, uh, uh, 85 every three year, an um, every who everyone who is certified ICCP uh, needs to then recertify every three years to demonstrate they are current with um, their knowledge. They need to just submit a couple of proofs um, that they have continued to be active in septic practice, and that's essentially it. And that recertification is then 85 uh, Canadian dollars currently. Um, which is, which okay. is, by the way, which is important. I just add to that. It's yep. is that every every professional certification program uh, requires the applicants to keep current, you know, keep up with it because you know SEPTED is an evolving field. It doesn't stay static. We're not just doing what Oscar recommend Oscar Newman and Jane Jacobs and and uh, and the others recommended in 1971. I mean, that's half a century ago. I mean, the field mm -hmm. evolves. You know, if you're still doing just natural surveillance. And you haven't considered some of the other more advanced concepts like second generation septet, or even now what we're developing a third generation septet. If you haven't been keeping up with the, the field and the profession, you're going to fall behind. So the recertification makes sure that you you keep current. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Exactly, and the ICAs um, also organizes some webinars where we have a bibliography and um, other type of uh, products where uh, people can continue to educate as well. And we have um, uh, our newsletter as well with some of the case studies. But the idea is also that you you also work in the field and you, you can demonstrate that you have been active over the past few years. Yeah, thank you for that, Greg. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so with the application, so application needs to include information about yourself, uh, payment fee, um, as well as um, uh, you will need to have uh, some kind of references, usually about two references uh, that we require so that someone can attest to your professional um, exposure in the field. So that's the application. Okay, and then after you, we have su successfully um, kind of checked that you you satisfy the required criteria, then we invite you to complete the record book. So this is something we have mentioned several times. So the record book is essentially your accepted Bible in a way. So it, it kind of demonstrates uh, what you have done. It, it, um, it's a record of your experience. You need to then ex uh, describe for each competency how you have acquired it, and then also provide supporting evidence for um, that competency. So if we're, for example, looking at um, competency three, uh, where you need to demonstrate your ability to collect and analyze information, data, um, that's where you're basically going to also provide maybe excerpt or the whole report to us from your project, if your project, project work that will demonstrate how you've done that and how that helped you address the problem that you have identified. So the record... Yeah, Greg, you would like to add something? I was just going to say that uh, essentially it can get very daunting at this point to the applicant goes, oh, man, that's a lot of stuff I have to cover here. But essentially what okay. it comes down to is if you've had some courses, you had some training, you read the core books, uh, and maybe you, you did a couple of projects, that's that gets you started. At that point, you have your course certificate, you have you know, experience from the books, you have a, a couple of project reports and so forth. That's the beginning of the evidence that you're filling into the record book. And so if you look through the competency, mm -hmm. each of the competencies have those abilities. Remember KSAs, the abilities, the five or four or five, six key things in bold at the start of the PDF of each competency section. Those are the things you're going to demonstrate. And when you do the record book, basically each page is a different competency. So page one is the scoping. And then you're going to say, okay, here's, here's a project in which I satisfied my, you know, my requirements for the competency on scoping in this report. You can see that. And then the second for the next competency and so on and so on and so forth. So essentially it's project reports that, that do most of the evidence and the proofs. Um, also other things can apply. Of course, you've taken seminars, workshops, videos, and so forth. Those apply too. That you can include that stuff as well, not just project reports, but the project mm -hmm. reports are kind of the, 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 uh, the basics of how this stuff works. And just one more other comment, Mattia, if I could just uh, mm -hmm. um, delay you one more point, one more moment here. Uh, I didn't want to forget, which was, we're always in the process of upgrading the, the program. And one of the areas we're upgrading now is the record book. We're trying to digitize it and get it online in the matrix format. We're not there yet uh, because it's a lot of work, but uh, that's kind of the next goal in the next six months or year, what have you, is to take the record book and make it uh, dig digital as digital as possible online. So I just wanted to mention that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Greg. At the moment, there's a template online for the record book, but you're very welcome to also do your own type of report that basically just follows those um, uh, those kind of sections in a way. Um, yeah. Okay, so the record book then goes to three of our reviewers within the um, ICCP committee. Uh, and once the reviewers examine everything then, and they're satisfied that the competencies are uh, kind of satisfied, uh, then we invite you to um, uh, to go to the exam stage. We might also get back to you and say, could you maybe provide some more evidence to us or could you maybe add uh, something when it comes to that competency description or explanation and so on, but that's obviously depends on case by case basis. So when we invite you to, um, to the next exam stage, it's basically a take home exam, it's very simple. Uh, you submit six questions to us, and then we select usually around three or four of those questions. We may add some uh, additional questions if we deem um, they are needed. 
Uh, but essentially, this is a take-home exam which you uh, complete at, in your own at your own pace and in your own time. Uh, or you, we can also arrange a Zoom type of oral exam or even an exam at a conference, so we can have a face-to-face um, -face chat there as well. So again, this goes to the three reviewers, the same three reviewers who have reviewed your record book. And once the reviewers are satisfied uh, that you have successfully addressed um, all the exam requirements, then we actually finalize your application and we award you um, the ICCP um, either practitioner or professional level certification. And we send you a certificate and a completion, completion letter. So. Yay. <laughs> so maybe just the duration of um, this whole process. Generally, we would expect that someone who has applied for ICCP certification completes the whole process at least within the two year period. That might not always be possible. So we would assess case by case basis, but generally because a lot can happen in two years. So if someone has applied, we would expect that they're kind of proactive towards obtaining certification and they that they are maybe doing some project work that's needed um, for them to be able to satisfy some of the competencies rather than kind of leave, letting it um, wait and you know time goes by. And so we would kind of, if the two year period has passed and they haven't really done anything, uh, we would kind of expect them to reapply if they wanted to go about certification. But like we said, it's uh, we decide that on a case by case basis. Yeah. And and not I mean you know we people don't typically fail out of the program, uh, but people right. have come to the program and they haven't finished and, and, and you know it's not like failing but they've decided that it's not for them or they don't have the time or they move on in life to other things so not everybody gets to the program, but most mm -hmm. people do and and I will tell you that uh, it may not happen as quickly as you like you you may submit your stuff you may have background been doing septed for a long time and say oh boy I could get that and submit your paperwork and expect it to be done in two or three weeks. Uh, probably won't happen because you know we have to assemble a review board and the review, review board are all people who are ICCP certified and they're all members of the ICA and they're busy people, they're professionals, they're working in different parts of the world. And so the lead reviewer has to assemble those people and has to get the paperwork and distribute it out. So there's a lot of procedures and kind of paperwork we have to make sure that we, we, you know, we get our uh, ducks in a row, as they like to say, uh, to make sure that things are covered off, you know. And so it, it may take a while. And and um, and so, but once you're in the program, we don't we don't want to fail you out. We want to help you succeed. And so, mm -hmm. the, the lead reviewer may assign you a mentor, and the mentor may contact you and say, "Well, oh, the committee looked at your application, and you know, competency number, you know, number number five. You know, you haven't you've demonstrated you can read plans, but you haven't really demonstrated that you have a mastery of plans, or that you actually done development that turns into a plan with your recommendations." Um, or make recommendations to make a change in a plan is very different from learning how to read a plan. So you cover competency four well, but you don't cover competency number five well. So as a mentor, we'd like you to do the following. And that could take another three or four months. And that's okay. We don't see that as an impediment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. And um, even like the, the, the most labor intensive part, even for you as an applicant, will be uh, completing the record book and putting all the information together because um it, it, you know if, if you have everything or the documentation it might actually be quite quick but for a lot of people um they might actually need to go back and chase some of the files from uh, years ago so right. um, and they get, and they get worried be, because they can't get a lot of the files or reports they're confidential and they're worried about you know and that's just never been a problem with us we've we, you can redact things out of it you yes. can have a letter sent from the employer says yes they did that we can't show you but and that's very normal in this kind of an industry Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I actually wanted to add that, yeah, that that's some, sometimes a worry that they can't submit something to us. But like you said, they can redact, they can uh, have some type of other evidence, they can extract uh, yeah. the pages that are needed and so on. But also we, we keep it very confidential and then we also, um, we, we discard of the files once the certification has been approved. So, right. so there's no uh, worry. We, we also are binded by confidentiality as um, the ICCP uh, committee. So, so yeah. Okay. Um, I, th yeah. Anything else, Greg? Here? No, I just, I just the same sort of uh, uh, discussion. I think for the last question, which is the cap uh, process, or was there something else that we needed to cover? Yeah. 
No, I yeah, I kind of wanted to ask you to maybe just cover the camp process, which um, right. So maybe yeah. Sorry, I'll hand it over okay. to you. Okay. So. Uh, so anyway, what Matei described for ICCP, uh, all that material uh, on the website is also available on the website for the CAP program. And, and so here is the example of what you read when you come into the into the website, you read through the different steps there. And again, like Matei, I won't bore you with going through each step of this, uh, but these are the general, step, general steps in the process. And there's four of them um, if your course approved. And so obviously... You have to you know, read, you read the program online uh, and go to the go to the information, read it. Which level you want, whether it's class A or class B, you may not know. You want to call call us about that. But do you want the whole course or do you want just a, um, a one competency? You have to make that choice so we know what we're dealing with here. Once you've done that, then you go to the next level, which is you submit the application and the agreement, which is you know has confidentiality stipulations and has. Uh, requirements of the code of ethics and all the other things that go along with that that's inside the application uh what's the current fee matea running for the cap program the grant fee um yeah. so yeah so for the four class a um accreditation it's currently a thousand canadian dollars right. and for individual competencies it's 300 per competency so right. that's applies to has b mm -hmm. Right, right. So, and so for a lot of competencies, course competencies, that's pretty standard in the industry. I think you'll find if you look around. Uh, again, we review the, the the fees based on the structure and how much time we have to spend on it. And so, but that's the current sort of structure, fee structure. Uh, then that will come to again the uh, the board, uh, the uh, cap board, which is which is I, I manage that, and we'll assemble a team of of three people who are reviewers, and it goes out to the the material. And you will uh, be, well, actually before that happens, you go to step four, which is complete the matrix. Now, online, there's a matrix we use. And that, so this part actually is digitized. We're working on doing that for the certification program. We actually have done that for the CAP program. And the matrix really, uh, there's, so there's no rec record book per se. The matrix just has you uh, fill in uh, you know, the, the columns, and, and the, the cells inside the columns. And it'll say, you know, what, you, what have you done for this competency uh, for in, in your course? What? How do you teach this competency in your course? I teach it with um, a group exercise. Uh, an online webinar. Okay, great. And then the, the next uh, section in the matrix will say, okay, how do you evaluate students for that competency? Well, they have to deliver a, a project at the end of the thing in which they get evaluated, or we have some tests on that or what it happens to be. And then the next next column in the matrix will say something like, uh, what is the what does the curriculum look like? Submit your evidence. And you click on that cell and it allows you to send your information to uh, to us so we can have a look at the actual material, and that and once that matrix is completed for your eight uh, core competencies, if you're doing class A, or your one or two if you're doing class B, we'll look at that, review it, and we'll give you a final review um, and project completion, which is the last step there. And that's basically the the cap uh, the cap process. Did I miss anything, Matan? Mm -hmm. um, maybe just uh, the, with the matrix. We also ask that uh, the applicants submit some of the files. So, uh, for example, if you know if, if they say they're using a short teaching exercise, PowerPoint right. slides, then we kind of ask to have that reviewed as well because we want to see how what the content is that they're teaching right. and how they're teaching, so how they're delivering. Right. And yeah, yeah. we actually need mm -hmm. to see the curriculum. I mean, I, and a lot of instructors go, "Well, it's my curriculum. It's private. It's confidential." Well, that. First of all, it doesn't that doesn't change if you have proprietary ownership over your curriculum, which you do through copyright. Doesn't that it doesn't change the copyright? You're not signing your copyright over to us. It still remains with you. So we're held we're held by that legal agreement. And then secondly, mm -hmm. we're also held by our code of ethics and our privacy agreement. So we're you know and anyway, you should also know that people who are on the review committee don't get asked to come on the committee unless they've had many years of teaching many septic classes, and they frankly they've probably seen it all and they probably already have it. And, uh, and and inside the conference, once you get to the ICA and inside the conference, we're always exchanging information and techniques anyway. But but uh, but anyway, it is confidential, so you know that. And uh, but we do need to see the curriculum. We do need to see the the course materials, the the powerpoints, the the exercises, mm -hmm. and all that. We need to see the actual material to to be able to assess the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's the cap program. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we have covered quite a lot of ground um, today, Greg. So um, is there anything else that you think we should kind of cover or did we do we want to emphasize something? So just some 
Could you thoughts very briefly? Yeah, I mean, I think that's it. There's the, 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 the dozen or so of the key questions we've been getting, the frequently asked que questions we've been getting as uh, on the committee about certification, about accreditation, uh, and some of the nuts and bolts. And this has been a very sort of technical uh, presentation about how you actually have submit application forms. And so um, that should answer many of your questions. Uh, we, we, we will ask applicants to review this webinar prior to submitting so that they know some of the questions get answered ahead of time. Uh, we're excited mm -hmm. about the program. It's been very successful around the world. Um, it's allowing SEPTEP practitioners everywhere to have a, a, a common basis of knowledge to be able to move our profession forward. And so we just feel it's a great, it's a great professionalization of the industry. And we've been delighted at the response and how, how competent and how exciting mm -hmm. the people are about the program. So, so that's it mm -hmm. for me in Denver and from you, Mateo. Yeah, no, and I, I kind of want to second that and add how actually exciting it is to be able to speak to professionals from the other side of the world and right. kind of hearing that they are dealing with the same challenges or yeah. issues, and yet it's contextualized in their own environment. So I think right. this is something that, you know, our program, yes, it has the competency that we expect every septic practitioner will have, but they obviously will practice those within their own context. Right. So because we're focusing on the process, not the content, I think it's something that um, that is unique uh, to basically practitioners all around the world. So, right. Right. Um, yeah. Right. So, on behalf oh. of the ICA and the CAP committee, and yeah, uh, that's it for me from Denver <laughs> and Mateo. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just just if, some concluding information before we part. So, again, if you'd like to reach us, uh, here is um, a the email address for ICCP programs. So again, um, I am the coordinator of that program, so Matea Mihinyac. Uh, you can also find more information on the website. Um, you, you have all the information in the banner below. Um, and for the course accreditation program, Greg is your man for that. <laughs> uh, again, you can reach him on um, the email address provided below and also read more about the program uh, here following the email, uh, the address here. Um, do join us if you're not yet a member. So again, remember that in order to apply for either certification or accreditation program, you also need to be a member because we want to make sure that you're part of our community and that you're kept up to date with the developments and um, the organization in general. So we do want you to join us. <laughs> um, on that note, I will also end with a brief um, ICA promo video. So thank you again for joining us today. If you have any questions, do please not hesitate to contact us and enjoy the final promo video. So thank be you. safe, thank everyone. You, thank you. And thank you so much, Greg, for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye.